Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. Our guest today is Jeff Lamry. Jeff is a machine builder with over a decade of experience working in a bunch of different sectors, including extensive work in industrial automation. Jeff, welcome to the pod. Spencer, thanks for having me. Hey, pleasure to have you here, buddy. We've been uh, talking about it for a while. It's good to finally be doing it. It is. It's finally uh, been a long time coming. Yeah. Well, and like you and I will have a drink and, and tell war stories, and I figured it would be fun to do it here because it's like that's my favorite thing about making these is hearing the crazy stuff that goes on uh, when you're out there in the field. Absolutely, and I've seen plenty. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess just to go right in, um, do you want to maybe tell that uh, that sort of snack food story you told me? Or can you can you tell that one? I could I could talk about that. Uh, you know, dangerous clients <laughs> and uh, folks all get you in trouble. But absolutely. Uh, we had uh, a client of ours that uh, one of the engineers uh, decided to play around with the controls a little bit too far, uh, eliminated all the safeties on the the actuator. Let's probably roll it back. The actuator was a 5G acceleration actuator. <laughs> so it's a linear motor, right? Linear motor actuator, yeah. and it had 5G acceleration, so a super high speed, super high speed everything. Uh, processing on their main one of their main assembly lines. Can you say what this was being used to do? It yeah. was water jetting um, their food products. Okay, cool. So they so like like a piece of dough that they were cutting out into a shape to like ship basically. Exactly, okay. and it was uh, basically it was a super high speed cutting system on their main production line, and one of their engineers decided to take liberties with it, to try to get uh, more production or whatever the reason may be. Maybe he was just bored. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> at the time, he, um, knowingly or not, he eliminated several layers of safety mechanisms. He must have known. I would hope he would have, but you never know. And uh, the long story short was he ended up crashing the actuator at full speed, you know, 5G acceleration over his uh, 10 foot actuator. So it hit the end stops at God knows, how, probably five meters a second, if not higher. Wow. And uh, blew through a solid aluminum block, <laughs> three concrete walls, um, and they found uh, the carriage <laughs> in the woods across from their parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a pretty big uh, fuck up on their part. But That's incredible. Yeah, it was uh, pretty impressive uh, how, how he managed to do that because <laughs> there's several layers of safety built in and he bypassed them all <laughs> but it was pretty interesting because uh obviously main line going down it was a pretty big deal for them so it was a scramble to get them up and running again and that is a whole nother story in itself <laughs> can you go into it or oh uh, we could talk about it uh so end up uh they sent a private jet up to get a replacement actuator for them uh <laughs> they they uh, they said they would handle it. Don't worry about it. And you know these are linear motors, so you're dealing with high magnetic forces. You know on planes, they gotta be shielded. You know they gotta counteract the forces of the magnets. They didn't think they needed to do that. Uh, they stuck the actuator with the magnets in the tail of the plane where all the avionics were, <laughs> and, and they lost avionics on the plane. So I ended up having to damn near crash the plane and had to fly blind <laughs> and fly it manually to land the plane and get, the, get their brand new actuator. So it was uh, one of the better uh, <laughs> better mess ups I've ever seen. That's life, incredible. That's for sure. Did they ever get the line back up and running? They did. Um, it cost them several million dollars, <laughs> um, but they did absolutely. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> All right, so like just to rewind a little bit, how does a person get into machine building and like what, what kind of attracted you to the field? Um, so I, I grew up with it. Um, my father was an engineer, my grandfather was an engineer. Cool. And so I guess I'm third generation now an engineer. It's awesome. Um, you know, uh, all the men in my family are actually engineers and we all, uh, we're all automation engineers. So we deal with machine builders and things like that. Um, and my father owned a company and I grew up around it. My dad used to bring me around to factories. He used to pull me out of school to help him fix machines <laughs> and 
that I, it is just always something I found so fascinating That's that awesome. you can make these machines move and, and do all this different stuff that is like back you know back in the 90s that that was like science fiction and then you get to see like what the capabilities of the technology were and it was always something that fascinated me that's really awesome i also kind of got started at an early age so as a kid i was doing different stuff i was programming graphing calculators and building like really simple hobby grade robots and just making we were trying to sell locker alarms say they're sixth graders mm -hmm. But I feel like, you know, you and I aren't that old. I think we're like in our 30s. Yep. So I, I feel like to know what the tech in the 90s was like as a 30-something year old, I mean, you had to be messing around as like a seven, eight-year-old kid. Yeah, that's exactly. So my yeah. uh, my father refused to learn CAD. Um, so he, he had his children learn it, <laughs> you know, and we had malleable minds and we picked it up quick. And uh, so I was lucky at a young age to be exposed to that type of things and that type of industry. And... Um, you know, I just was off running after that. Once I got into it, you know, it's hard to get away. <laughs> That's awesome. So CAD for people listening, computer-aided design, uh, programs like SolidWorks, Pro Engineer. Yep. Uh, what did you get started on? Uh, Pro Engineer was my first. So I'm back, Interesting. Uh, so it was uh, what Wildfire 4 back then. Now it, now it's not even called Pro Engineer. It's called Creo. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I don't know if that shows our age or what, but... Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so uh, it, it was just something I was exposed to young, and I, I, I fell in love with uh, doing the CAD work. And uh, what really intrigued me about it was I could draw something on a computer and then put that into a CNC and you could have a part in your hands. And that's what really, really sold it to me. You got to do that in the 90s? Oh, yeah. On a CNC part. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was something I loved was taking something that you could draw and you get a part out of it. And it was... I found that so fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. And it's such it, like it's like that such a rewarding thing is seeing something that you made cut in metal, you know, and yeah, make, make these I parts. Agree. And it, yeah, after that, I, I was sold. <laughs> How'd you learn about like geometric dimensioning and tolerancy and like? Oh, I learned the hard way. <laughs> <That's what you're laughs> yeah, no, there, there's a uh, you know, basically I was sat down with a book, <laughs> and uh, that's how I learned CAD. Was I was given a book, and uh, you just. I, I guess a lot, a lot of it was self-taught and trial and error and things like that. Can you talk about like some of the errors uh, that helped you like learn? Like, try to think. Like early on, I feel like I I made some fuck ups. Like I I would use solid core wire for long runs, and mm -hmm. you'd bend something and it would break. Like, I probably should use multi stranded next time, for instance. For sure. Me. Um. Yeah, so we were dealing a lot with, uh, so a lot of stuff that I was exposed to at a young age was we were dealing sub-micron level position oh, systems. Oh, wow. So um, from a young age, we were doing super high precision stuff to where all the tolerances matter. You know? Yeah. You're not going to get that sub-micron accuracy unless you understand the tolerance stacks. It makes sense. Um, so it was something that was kind of ingrained to me at a young age. Of how how to how to analyze that and how to build a a high precision system, um, and yeah, it, it was really just from on the job training, you know, doing it, seeing these factories, seeing what they're doing, and the type of work we were doing where people needed that that super high accuracy. You know, you had to analyze every detail. You had to understand uh, five thou here, five thou there, five thou there. It adds up real quick. And all of a sudden you're outside your specs. So, you know, that was, uh, you know, after I learned CAD, the next thing I learned was how to, how to run a CNC and how to make those quality parts. Um, so it was just very much um, ingrained in me at a young age. What kind of, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, what kind of CNC tool, like, did you start out with, if I can ask? Yeah, so I, I learned on a bridge port, a manual uh, three-axis bridge port was how I learned. Nice. Um, after that, you know, I grew into the... I, that's how I learned, too. Like a Haas, you know, VMC or whatever. Nice! Um, but yeah, it was uh, a manual bridge port is what I learned on. That's awesome. Yeah, same here. I, I spent a lot of time on manual bridge ports in the Field Robotics Center at Carnegie Mellon. and mm -hmm. Just dicking out, obviously older than you were when you got into it. I uh, <laughs> was a late bloomer in that way. But... Um, I, I got started early with electronics, and then when I was like in college, I started machining things. 
So the Bridgeports are great. Uh, for people listening, the Bridgeport J Head Mills have been around since the 1960s, as far as I know. Probably, yeah. If and, not earlier. <laughs> yeah, maybe even earlier. And, and the design is iconic. It's it's like Americana. It hasn't really changed a whole lot, as far as I know, since then. But just a solid machine. You run it with um, basically three cranks, I think. And yeah, it's just three belts. crank and crank mills and X Y Z. Yeah, yeah, ball screws and all that good stuff. And yeah, honestly, I'd recommend anyone like you want to learn how to mill some parts, get yourself a bridge port. Yeah, they're great, and I mean, you can get them for like two to five grand, I think, these yeah. days. Yeah, like depend how much Super work affordable. you want to put in. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, they're pretty sweet. What kind of what kind of so you got into the Haas VMC after that? Mm -hmm. Those are cool. I haven't messed around with them a lot, I'll be honest. But I was doing some uh, chip collection work in a, in a certain job I was at, where we were trying to clear the chips off of different uh, VMCs, mostly like Doosan stuff, and uh, mainly the Doosans. What we were focusing on the Doosan. Um, trying to think what the model was, DVF 5000 Vertical Machining Center. Mm -hmm. And um, quite a bit more than the Bridgeport, they're like 300 grand. Oh yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> those are some serious equipment there. <laughs> they're sweet, but I remember seeing a video of the way someone was doing it with a Haas. And I mean, we were looking at like clean in place systems like they use in the soft drink industry and you know, just nozzles that move around and blast chips off and then how do you blast the spot where the nozzle's at? Because that's where chips tend to want to accumulate. Sure. So you need like a stainless shroud and then maybe even another nozzle from up top blasting onto that. And so um, I'm trying to think. I was trying to find inspiration. I saw somebody with a Haas and they had two stainless buckets they'd welded up and they would just fill up slowly with coolant from like the, the coolant system. Mm -hmm. And then when they would get full, I guess the fulcrum was like slightly off the center of gravity for the full bucket. So it would just pour over. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, it's uh, it was kind of janky, but like it <laughs> was, solution. <laughs> it was pretty hilarious at the same time. I guess it's because they were working with low pressure and they wanted to be able to push a lot of coolant at once. That was the idea yeah. of whoever owned that VMC came up with. Yeah, it's a story in itself. I had to get that Haas. That was a, a long corporate battle trying to convince them to get the Haas. So how did that go? I'm, I'm kind of curious. Well, so we had a, we, we were, I was working for product development at the time. And we were developing uh, an actuator and we wanted to make it so a single person could build the actuator in less than an hour was the goal. So okay. we could take a raw stock extrusion in our, in our billets and we could have the finished product within an hour of getting the order. That's cool. So that was the goal. And it basically, we were, we were pretty well with it. And we, we trained up, a, it was a tool maker machinist that we trained up to basically, he would run the run the mill, he would set it up, and we set it up to be basically be all bank and go. You know, you, you bank put the billet, yeah, basically you put the billets in, you bank it, bank it against some some pins, you clamp it. I gotcha. And then you... you, you so you bank hit. is like push it back against the pins. Yeah, basically push it back against the pins so you set your zeros and yep, then you're off running. And uh, we essentially trained a, a CNC tool maker to assemble, you know, he already knew how to run the mill. So what we thought was, you know, the mill takes 45 minutes to run to process the parts. So in that time when he was making the parts, he could be assembling the other, the other uh, pieces of the, the actuator. That makes sense. Um, That's cool. Okay. And so it was a very uh, uh, cellular manufacturing type setup. Yeah. To where like we that. set up to, you know, Kanban style. You know, pull the parts off you need. You can build build your pieces while the machine's running. When the parts are done, throw it That's in awesome. and get it done. And we were able to do it to where basically you could place order at 10 a.m. and we could ship it out by noon. That's really fucking cool. Mm -hmm. And so that was how. Uh, but you know that battle itself, I, I kind of sidetracked there. You know, it was uh, very hard to convince. You know the big corporate company to get them to buy into that method. Why? What was the resistance you came up against? You know, it's the capital expenditure of buying a CNC and all that. So Haas is like a hundred grand. Last I checked, for people listening. Right. Yeah. Um, so you know, it's it's hard to get a company to make that capital expense. Um, so we did plenty of work to justify. You know, if you do this, we we could produce these. You know, 
in an hour, you know, and we could train one guy, right? And I was thinking, you can only get one guy at a time, and that's all we were allotted. So, you know, we, we were working with what we had at the time, and, um, you know, it ended up working. It ended up being a super successful project. That's awesome. Um, you know, it's still a, a proc today. Um, made to order. Yeah, it's, it's all made to cool. order, and it's yeah. uh, basically, at, you know, as, as they're ordered, we build them, and we can produce them, you know, by in an hour. That's awesome. Yeah. So in that case, you don't need to anodize or anything like that. You just machine ship and go. Well, so we basically anodized pre, uh, basically beforehand for a lot of that stuff. Um, the the parts that you know di were internally didn't need to be anodized. Um, Makes sense. They're already finished. So we were, well, a lot of times you'll mask anodize this part anyway, and you'll do post machining. So if you were just adding a bunch of holes, I mean, essentially, yeah, yeah, then you're fine. I mean, yeah, it's better that you don't. And a lot of it was extrusion based, so we we had extrusions, and we were just doing the finishing uh, finishing work on there. That makes sense. Yeah. So I'm guessing you just had multiple configurations, which is why you had to do it. Yeah. So this order. project, uh, it actually had, oh man, sixteen hundred configurations per series, and there's five different series. Five different. Yeah. So there's five different sizes, basically frame sizes of the project. Um, well, each one so has. It's like seventy five hundred, eight eight thousand yeah. different. Wow. Yeah. And the whole, that's that was kind of the selling point was we could create you know these eight thousand different actuators on one setup. That's super cool. Yeah. So it was a lot of work in making that happen. You know, plenty of thought went into that to make it work <laughs> that way. Um, but yeah, uh, it was uh, you know that was a two year long project. That's all I did for two years was developing that that product. And, wow. Um, uh, you know, I was 20 years old at the time. I was still in school um, working for them. You know, I used to <laughs> work from my dorm room on it and then I'll uh, <laughs> travel in the summers up to New York to work for them. And, that's awesome. Um, so after that, you know, that's how they, uh, you know, took me into product development. Nice. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that R&D stuff is my favorite thing. I haven't done as much production work as you. So did you come up with the, the Kanban idea like to have the one guy do all that i did uh so that was uh at first they actually didn't even want it to be extruded um they wanted to be it was a, originally a plate design um it was four plates that would have to be bolted together and it required something like 48 bolts to bolt together holy fucking shit and so we figured that you know the amount of time it would take the amount of hardware it'd take to just piece <laughs> all those together um <laughs> I actually took liberties on myself to push an extrusion design and I actually designed it without their permission. Nice. Um, and then I've done that before I, too. I showed them the the basically the what I came up with to resolve that issue, and they end up loving it, and that's what ended up becoming the product. Nice. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. What made you want to do that? Like, I mean, I feel like I sort of know what would make me want to do that, but like, what what makes an engineer sort of take matters into their own hands and yeah so i've always been the type of person i want to build the best thing i can and you know i i saw the the original design and to me it wasn't a product it looked like something that anyone could build right anyone could take plates and piece them together and make make that right yeah. that's not a product when you extrude something and you got designed to it and you know it made it look like a finished product and admittedly themselves they admitted that that hey this is a product you know nice it is clean it was smooth and, and not only that it actually resolved a lot of heat issues within within the actuator because uh uh with linear motors to get quite hot makes sense and the, the issue we were having at the time was that the heat from the motor would actually crush our bearings Fuck me. Yeah, so it was uh, it was actually a necessary evil to do that because the extrusion actually ended up being a, basically a large heat sink for the actuator. That's awesome. And it made it actually perform better also. That's so great. So not, not only did it reduce parts. I would imagine you'd have less thermal issues too with regard to accuracy and dimensional stability. Correct. And, you know, we were trying to create a, a relatively high precision system. It was uh, 30 micron accuracy. That's pretty good. Yeah. Um, so... It, it resolved the thermal issues while also reducing the number of parts and the ease of assembly. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Really cool. So 
No, that's, that's quite an accomplishment. I guess I'd be curious to hear about some of the other things you've worked on in your career that you're like really proud of. Yeah, so I, I've some of my favorites are some of the larger machines I built. Um, you know, I, I've done stuff for injection motors for high volume stuff. I've done how high of volume? Hundreds of thousands. Wow. An hour. Okay. Yeah. An hour. An hour. That's insane. Uh, yeah. So how often do you have to replace the tooling on a on a mold that does a hundred thousand pieces an hour? Not as much. Not as often as you think. The molds themselves will run and for quite a while. How many millions? Like, yeah, you'll get several million out of it. Okay. I think the order is for two hundred million pieces. Wow. Um, so, you know, to get that, that, that level of volume, you know, we are processing something around 350 parts a minute, something like that. Wow. Um, yeah, so in a day, you know, you're probably... Single cavity or you had multiple? No, th so this was a 48 cavity mold. Okay, that makes yeah. more sense. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're processing 48 pieces at a time every seven seconds. Wow. Yeah, so That's it awesome. was uh, pretty high volume. And, and I really enjoyed that stuff because... It was something I I never done before. I got into that position, and once I got into it, I was like, "Wow, this is this is some serious automation." You know? <laughs> like, yeah, you, know, you don't get to deal with that type of volume on a lot of things, you know. So it was definitely uh, unique being in, in the plastics industry. It's cool, and uh, seeing those type of volumes, you know. Did the time for the plastic to cool present a challenge at all? Absolutely, yeah. So that was the thing, you know. So we did a lot of testing and all we had was cool parts when we were doing the testing because right? that's all we had. But we learned pretty quickly that the parts fresh off the machine, still a little warm, they're still a little tacky, you know, and that uh, that definitely created, uh, you know, through, through some kinks in, in the machine uh, that we had to adjust for. But, uh, you know, it didn't throw us off too much. How would you get around that issue? Like, what did you do to solve it? Uh, it, it was really just timing on the systems. You know, we just had to play around with the timing and the sequencing of things and set some delays and stuff. Cool. Besides that, it was uh, relatively simple. That makes a lot of sense. So just wait for it to cool down, basically. And it was seconds. You know, yeah. it was you know, two seconds here, a second there. That's okay. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so it was, uh, it was nice. We were still there to hit our target and get the volumes we needed. Nice. How many parts did you have to throw in the trash when you were figuring out that? <laughs> oh, God. Uh, probably 10,000. <laughs> they gave us boxes, boxes of parts to, the, to test with. So, yeah, we That's went awesome. through quite a few. <laughs> that makes sense. Is it uh, you don't make an omelet without cracking some eggs? <laughs> yeah, no, they gave us uh, plenty, plenty of scrap to play with. <laughs> nice. Yeah, no, I mean, I feel like that's always a thing, uh, like at least in all the R&D projects I've done is you got to break a lot of stuff before you get it right. And um, I mean, there's one thing we made where there was a table integrated into it. And I remember um, we had to throw out like four or five tabletops because mm. <laughs> we kept scratching them up with the robot and like punching through it. And well, so, so we just bought extra tables. <laughs> well, ironically, our biggest issue was actually the cameras inspections. So what we were dealing with clear parts and, you know, silly overlook, you know, looking back on it is silly overlook. You know, you learn from experience, but of course. we had a, a silver background <laughs> and it didn't work Mirror. well with the cameras, you know, so we ended up having to black it and and I said black to make it work well uh, to get the cameras in working. Because uh, it was all 100%, 100% inspection. That was the other part of the machine was every every single part that came through that line was inspected for quality nice. control. Would well, you want in like a Cognex system or? Uh, yeah, I think it was a Cognex. So we were Those running. are great. I mean, yeah. The plug yeah I've used some plenty. They're, they're yeah, fantastic they're awesome. cameras. <laughs> Reliable, just bulletproof. Yep. And, you know, so we, we were checking for defects in the part, color, color distortions, things like that. If the part was burned from the mold. Nice. Like, things like that. Um, short shots, you know. How'd you singulate the parts to get them through inspection? So what we did, we uh, basically get had, them in a line for people. Listening. Yeah, we, we uh, essentially had a single single. So we we dropped the parts onto the conveyor, and we we formed into a single line, and then we'd form an array off of that, and we'd inspect the array, and the array would be able to tell you which line had a bad, bad part in, and we would reject that part off of that. We had a robot nice. that would pick because essentially the robot that would. Pick it and put it in the box would also reject. That's awesome. 
So you just had like a reject bin that it would throw it into? Yeah, so I just threw it right behind and just... Single robot or you had a bunch of lines in parallel that made up that? There's multiple lines. And each line got its own robot? Exactly. Yeah, so we we had two lines that would form two arrays and they would... So 24 coming through each line every seven minutes that had to contend with. Okay, that's pretty hard. Seven seconds. Seven seconds? 48 every seven seconds, yep. Holy moly. Yeah, That's so we were moving. We were moving quick. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of robot did you use to keep pace with that? Uh, that was a Whitman. That was a nice. Whitman. Uh, they're they're really good. They they do well with. So we were dealing with the. Uh, they they would run off the press, and they were, they were also our press retrieval robot, um, and we used uh, basically a separate one that ran off, so and that would do our layer packing for the packaging. So press retrieval meaning it grabbed the finished parts off the press, or you had ejection pins for that. Well, so it inject off the press, but we had to feed it into our machine. So we take it directly off the press into our machine. Okay. And that was essentially what the press retrieval robot would do: is take it off the hot parts off the press, feed it into. Did our you have to use special end of arm tooling to grab all the parts off the yeah, press? Yeah, so it was all custom made end of arm tooling. Uh, one of the challenges with that was the mold uh, had alternating rows. They they. Uh, uh, like we're facing each other and we need them to be face all facing the same direction Brutal. so we had to flip every other row on the end arm tool so one row on the end arm tool was stagnant the other ones <laughs> had flippers on that we nice. had to flip and we each arm had four, four of those that's awesome and so we uh basically we would uh that was one of the challenges of the project is we had to get them all oriented the same way yeah um, you know, the little things that people don't tell, you know, like, yeah, oh, course. we thought the mold would be this way. It turns out, you know, <laughs> you got you to gotta make Had it. we known, we would have ordered a different mold. Well, and that was the thing, like, in retrospect, we would have just made the mold <laughs> in one way, but that's what we got. So we had to, yeah. basically, on the end of arm until we had to orient the parts and do a flip there. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I have, I have a buddy that's doing... Um, buckles for the adventure sport market so like off-roading and bike packing and stuff like that and he just he's doing single piece flow off of a brother's speedio and uh, he's been building a flip station which i mean it's much smaller than what you're describing but still it's it's fun to see that stuff work did you go pneumatic for the flip operation that was pneumatic at nice. that because it is simple you know we just had to turn 180 degrees we didn't need super accurate position or anything because we were processing more down the line. I would love to see that if there's any way. I, I, you might not be able I to I got some me. pictures, you know, <laughs> I, could, I could show you. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that was, a, that was probably, one of, probably one of the largest systems I ever built. It's probably the second largest system I ever built. Wow, what was the largest? Uh, the largest was is uh, in, in the same arena, injection molding, um, and that machine was, it ended up being uh, 45 feet by 35 feet 17 feet tall it's huge and it had uh man 54 axes of motion Ma- wow massive piece of equipment and that project was uh basically to take injection mold parts off the press and to f- stack an eight foot tall pallet so we stack an eight foot tall pallet full of parts and basically that would go on the truck. Did you have packing material that went between the parts or did they just get stacked against each other? Oh, uh, they would put uh, layers of cardboard in between. So nice. that was also part of the system. That's kind of why it was so big because the pallet, you know, is 48 inches, right? So I had 48 inches of parts, 48 inches of layers, 48 <laughs> inches of, it, you know, and so that's how the system got so large. Because if you're trying to build something that's 40 inches big, and we had four <laughs> things that we had to put in there, so we ended up building a, basically a 21-foot-long gantry system that would go and pick each part. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so it ended up being a massive system. And then the volumes itself were, uh, you know, they wanted an hour of accumulation. And whenever you're dealing with a high volume, an hour of accumulation is a shitload of parts. Hour of accumulation? <laughs> Yeah, so basically the idea was if the press needed to, or if the machine needed to shut down, but you want, you never want to shut down the press, right? Okay. So, you know, it's a pain in the ass to stop and restart a press. So the idea is never stop the press. Okay. So the idea is even if the machine has to stop, you, you always keep the press running. Interesting. So you had to be able to run the press for an hour with the machine stopped. Correct. And have it accumulate and then be able to catch up 
later. And, okay, interesting. Mm-hmm. So does that just go down to like just a big hopper? Essentially, you know, we played with the spiral conveyors <laughs> and all that. We we you know we played with that, and we figured that you know, the machine was able to process it faster than the machine uh, could produce than the mold could produce them. Um, so we we we. We end up needing less accumulation than what what they were ideally wanted. Um, yeah, cool. But it made the machine work, you know. Yeah, um, and I'm sure you saved, you know, many many feet, cubic feet. Yeah, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of dollars. Also, <laughs> <laughs> they're not cheap building those big old accumulation <laughs> systems. Yeah, that makes sense. So it was also yeah. cost saving because we're you know as all engineers you know you got a budget for a project and you gotta make it work with the budget you got um yep so you know that's also the challenge especially when you're building a machine that size it's always a negotiation i feel like with every project i've done where client wants it for x amount of money but they want all these features you're like well if you want it for that amount of money you gotta let go of something what what do you, what matters the most and so, yeah and i i got to deal with that some where i'm i don't know if it's fortunately or unfortunately i was the person setting the budget or at least asking for the budget. <laughs> and a lot of times the you know, the budget I asked for it wasn't what I got. And so, you know, that was just the part of the design that you had to factor in was okay, I was hoping for this much, I gotta make it work for this much, you know, where can it happens I, all the time. Where can I, you know, make my sacrifices, you know, what can you sacrifice, right? Without impacting the, the quality of the performance of the machine, you know, and that I don't know if that's just experience or what and where you could uh you know, leave yourself those outs, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. I mean, for me, a lot of it come down to like good mentorship. So just having people that were smarter than me, help me write some of those proposals. Sure. That were flexible enough where you get those outs. But also if the client comes back to you and slashes your budget by like a factor of two or three, I mean, you, you, in my experience, you go back to them and you say, well, you've got to slash your requirements then mm-hmm. in order to hit that budget. So what do you care about? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, unfortunately, we were selling to our own company at the time. <laughs> so we, we were a division of uh, a division of ourselves, if you will, and we were selling to one of the other divisions. So we didn't get a lot of say in that, <laughs> unfortunately. That's and it was kind bizarre. of it is what it is. Um, but it is 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 a whole different set of challenges because you know we were we were rolling in the machine to the overall order of the products. So the machine was just a value added to the order. You know, basically we get an order and we say, hey, we'll build you a machine that would process this 200 million part piece order. <laughs> and that was, you know, a selling point, but it was also what we got left to deal with. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. That's crazy though, that it just, that's just the order and you fill it any way you can. Mm-hmm. You could have people doing it, but much well, more and that was the thing. It, it, and historically, they're a very manual facility where they would have people that would sit there and, and stack the power pool parts. Brutal. Um, and For yeah, 200 million. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. The, and yeah. that's the volumes is what made it make sense to create the automation because they're very well aware, you know, it's a million dollar piece of automation. But the cost savings in the long run to produce that type of volume was an absolute necessity. It makes sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I, I one time I saw, I, I was touring somewhere where a buddy worked and there was a $32 million machine there. That was, it was probably the biggest thing I ever saw uh, in my career. And it had uh, Cognax inspection stations between every operation and they had pneumatic blow off for reject parts. Mm -hmm. And then there were extras on every piece of hard tooling. So it could swap in another one when that, when that tool got depleted. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that was, that was really fun to see. I I haven't got to work on a whole lot of that stuff though, unfortunately. So I'm pretty jealous around the stories. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's kind of, you know, like, as I mentioned earlier, you know, my dad used to just bring me around to these factories and (laughs) that's one of the blessings I had was just having all this exposure and, and, you know, being able to go into all these factories and seeing all these things. And I think that was a large part of what made me a good engineer was my exposure and seeing what's out there and how companies do certain things. And it made me learn a lot just of how people handle themselves with this type of stuff. Yeah. So like, what are some lessons you learned that way that you 
maybe like would have done it differently had you not seen it at all. I'd say just lots of tricks of the trade, you know, okay. like just certain things that unless you see how people are doing things, you know, you, you, it, it's not like you could go on the internet and see. Well, like I remember like seeing like blade simulation when I was touring this one machine building shop where they had uh, like needles from syringes uh, all in a bin and then they would have a blade with like a cutout of a needle pop up singulate a single needle and you could grab it off of that mm -hmm. so i never would have thought of that in a million years but yeah and it's a lot of those type of things so i was saying, like there's nothing in particular in my mind that's really sticking out at the moment yeah but yeah there there's so many countless examples of that and it's just those little ingenious things you know like people people love to complicate things yeah like people love to like oh you're building a machine you just add three axes and it'll flip and turn and do whatever you need to do. Or you could have a little stud there and it'll turn the part for you. You know, like, <laughs> like there, there's like the, the simple solutions are usually the, the best. best. And you know, like there's plenty of that where you're just like, Oh man, that's just genius. You know, makes like, sense. Um, there's been plenty of those where I've walked into factories. So I'm like, man, that's a brilliant idea. You know? So, yeah, there, there's plenty of examples of that. You know, there's, you know, people are creative and, you know, like you can never underestimate some, you know, some of these engineers. And I guess when this stuff's been being done for, you know, decades before and there's been other people tackling this problem, if you look at the ways it's been being done, then, you know, that's inspiration for the next. Exactly. And I think yeah. that was, you know, kind of what I was getting at with having the exposure to these different factories is I got to see a lot of different factories and different companies on the way that they're building stuff and how they made it work for them. And, you know, that's just, uh, you know. That's helped me in my career it, as It's well. an experience that's worth more than its weight in gold. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, just when you can broker an idea, you know, from over here and bring it over there. Well, exactly. And, you know, we're, we're all engineers and, you know, any engineer who gets inspiration from things, you know, they'll find other uses for it. You know? Yep. Uh, you know, I've taken plenty of ideas off YouTube and things that have <laughs> no relation at all to what Same. I was doing. And I've been incorporating the machines because, you know, it's just a clever solution. Yeah, no, we've used stuff from wire spooling and like water inspection mm -hmm. just to be able to like coil a cable reel uh, correctly when you're lowering and raising a sensor into and out of the water. Um, I mean, you'll pull stuff from all different kinds of places. I remember uh, trying to do something for the uh, shipping industry and looking at the way that they you remember those DLT tape machines from the 90s that would grab a tape out of a cassette thing and then put it into a cubby. So I use that to figure out how to stack packages in a truck. So like that, you know, right, it's like my, system. might as well have been like early uh, warehousing stuff today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, exactly. Same technology, just repurposed. That's exactly, you it. know, and that's, uh, you know, that's what I love about engineering is, you know, you could take a idea that was used for something totally different and apply it to your industry. You know, and that's, that's why, I, that's why I love about the creativity of engineering. No, I completely agree. And it's, it's super cool. It's also interesting how, like, some of the best ideas are just cribbed from somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, you know, people, people have been doing it for decades, and you'd be a fool not to learn from them. Exactly. Uh, you know, in the words of my one cousin, like, why reinvent the wheel? Yeah. yeah it's very cool. So what else? Um, I guess... It would be interesting to know, um, so you've done a bit of sales as well as engineering, like... Yeah, yeah. And I've gone to school for engineering, but I've never seen a program that trains people for sales. Why do you think that is? And, like, how do you learn to do sales? Do you need to have engineering experience first? How, how does that work? No, not at all. I'd say sales is more personality-based than anything. Okay. If you, like, I'd say, uh, you know, if you're uh, someone who, who's outgoing to talk to people and things like that, you know, you're, you're probably good for sales. <laughs> um, my benefit was being able to understand the technology. It made me... Well, more, technical sales is a whole other animal. Well, it, it made me a more effective salesman. Yeah. You know, because I understood the technology and I could be the technical expert to help them get going and get running and understand their applications. Um, but admittedly, uh, I'd never applied for any of my sales jobs. <laughs> All my sales jobs were people that approached me and they, they, uh, um, they, they, they thought 
by knowing me, they thought I could do well. Um, and, you know, I think I did pretty well. Yeah, I agree. Um, but, yeah, uh, it was just kind of something I fell into where people uh, approached me about, hey, you want to try to sell our products? And I was going to know about it, you know. Yeah. It's just an interesting career path because I don't think there's a traditional avenue. Everybody I know that's done it has been pulled into it. Yeah. And every salesperson I've recruited, I've pulled into it. I've never yeah, and, had and, somebody come up it, to me and wanted to bring them into a sales It is role. weird how, how it gets into it because I was very much like I'm an engineer. That's what I do. I build machines, you know, like I, I had no intention at all to go into sales. Um, but it, it was, uh, yeah, I was absolutely pulled into it by people. They, they uh, you know, they talked me into it. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. That's but yeah, cool. it, you know, it's very rewarding and, and immediately as, you know, as someone you like runs their, their, their businesses, you know, um, it's, it's a, it's a necessary skill set that if, you know, it's, it, it's great that you could create a product, but if you can't sell, it doesn't matter. You yeah. Know? Well, that's the Zig Ziglar quote, which is like, you can build a better mousetrap, but nobody's going to beat a path to your door without sales. Exactly. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, that's one of the things I learned was, you know, because I, I, I I've been laid off several times from jobs because they, their sales were, and I think that's kind of what inspired me really was because it's like, I wanted to set my own destiny. Right? Yeah. So sense. if I could create the sales myself, then I'll need to worry about getting laid off. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. And that was kind of my motivation behind it is where if I could learn that skill set, I won't need to worry about the future. I won't have to worry about what the next quarter looks like. Yeah. And if you know about the engineering side, that you're not just selling snake oil, like you actually know what you're selling is quality, you can stand behind it. Right. And it's it's a beautiful thing. I mean, yeah. No, and th and that's honestly what, why I started doing it. You know, I want to control my own destiny on that front. I have a lot of respect for that. Yeah. Very cool. What are, I mean, for technical sales, I feel like you got to have somewhat of an engineering background, but it sounds like you're implying you almost you don't. Honestly, right. most of the folk I'm with don't. Interesting. Um, and honestly, I, I've met, honestly, I'd say majority of the most successful salesmen I know in engineering sales do not have an engineering degree uh, because they're, they're not buying your product. They're, they're buying you. They're buying, do they believe in you and do... They believe that you could help them resolve that solution. That's the sale. It's not, you know, great. You might give them a product at the end of the day, but they're buying you at the end of the day. Yeah. So it's about trust. It's it's about trust and relationships and um, the, the if they believe that you could help them solve their problem. Because that's what a sale is at the end of the day, is solving someone's problem. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. So I would say it's very much about um, the belief in you more than anything else. Yeah. I'll buy that. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. But I guess now that you say that, I mean, there's sales people I've worked with where, I don't know, I don't, my friend Nikki sold in the biomed industry for years. I don't think she ever had like an uh, engineering degree, but great salesman. I mean, has climbed the ranks. Um, there's a guy from DMG Mori that I worked with that I really liked, uh, who you might have met over the years, uh, Billy from DMG Mori. Yeah. Okay. But uh, he was really good. Like he would get you whatever you needed, and you know he was he was just a really good uh, collaborator to work with. And um, I, I enjoyed meeting up with that guy because you know I knew whatever I needed, he was going to make it happen and figure out a way. Mm -hmm. If you had to beg, borrow, or steal. <laughs> well, and that's the thing, you know, like yeah. you know, there's the people that will just make sure shit gets done, and you know they'll move heaven and earth to make it happen. And you know you don't need to be an engineer to make that. You know, so you know as long as they're uh, on top of stuff, they communicate well, you know, and they're on top of it, you know, that's makes an effective sales. Person. That makes a lot of sense. Cool. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say it's at all limited to, you know, having an engineering mind or anything like that. You know, it's, it's, it's definitely more of the soft skills on the sales side. Yeah. makes sense. But that, that doesn't just apply to how you deal with a customer. That also applies how the, if the salesperson interfaces with their own company. Exactly. In order to affect yeah. things and get things done. Right. You get know, the information they need to convey to the customer. Yeah, and, and it's a lot decision. of the behind the scenes work of, you know, how they're conveying your needs to the manufacturer um, to get what you need, right? You know, they got to be able to commu communicate that effectively to their teams 
um, to make sure that, that you're getting the product that you need. You know? So I've never actually worked like a traditional straight up sales job. I mean, I've done it in my roles, you know, like when I ran my own company, I mean, I was doing a lot of sales just inherently as part right. of that job. Necessary but, people. <laughs> yeah, it absolutely was, it was a necessary skill to have. And so I guess it's interesting for me to hear you describe what it's like to work in a more traditional sales role because I've now experienced that. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's definitely the soft skills, you know, they can't they can't go underappreciated because it's I agree. it's just uh you know, it's it's a lot of it's not something you can be taught. You know, it's uh you know you know, you can learn, you can read the books, there's plenty of great books out there about how to win funds influence people. Right. You know, yeah. like uh there's the little red book of selling, you know, that's one of the Oh, I should that, read that. Yeah, it's a great one that uh, I read, read myself and nice. They preach in that that you know it's it's relationships, it's networking, it's getting in front of people, you know, being able to be comfortable speaking to people, you know, it's all those skills. It doesn't matter if you're the brilliant guy in the room, you know, if if you can't convey your message and you can't convince them that you could solve their problem, hey, you're not getting the sale. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you could be the most qualified guy in the world, but if you can't convince them that you are, doesn't it matter. doesn't matter. It makes sense. You know, so it's, uh, yeah, th- those type of skills can't go, you know, can't look them over. Yeah, that makes sense. I kind of want to read the Little Red Book of Sales now. Like that. I would recommend to anyone. It's a fantastic yeah. book. Awesome. I'm going to check it out. Yeah, that'll, that'll be my little plug. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey Gitmer. Nice. Yeah, fantastic. How long has it been around for? Like, is it? Well, it's been around for quite a while, probably over a decade. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. It was actually one of the first books my uh, my boss got me when I started in sales was my my first assignment was to read that book. Nice. Yeah. Bought me two books. It was the Marriott book um, that Marriott wrote. For how to sell and then the little red book of selling. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, that was my uh, first training exercise. Read this book. <laughs> when I worked in advertising, I remember they gave me the art of client service to read, which was really insightful and very different from like how to win friends and influence people. Mm-hmm. Um, and also some of the other books I've read on just human interfacing. Um, so, I mean, that made it really, it was really unique to advertising, but um, that's cool. Yeah, but what kind of shocked me about it it was because i was i was kind of like how you're thinking where it's like oh you need to be the technical guy you need to be the guy that knows everything yeah you got you know you got you got to have all the skills yeah and then you realize once you get into it that that's not at all the case you know it, it is so much more relationships and things like that and people putting their trust in you that you could solve their problem more than anything else yeah it makes sense like i'd say it's a factor of 10 you know it's great if you could so the technical skills are like one out of 10 yeah like it's great if you could do that but that's that's not what doesn't get you very far that's not going to make you the effective salesman yeah yeah interesting so it's an interesting dynamic even in engineering and i was dealing with pretty complicated stuff you know i was selling actuators and gearboxes and bearings for people and you know pretty high demanding clients but the engineering was like an added bonus that I, I could help them do that stuff. <laughs> like that was like, oh, that's a little extra cherry on top, you know, but that's all it was to them. Ah, uh, you yeah, know, that's fair. And you know, like, I, you know, trust me, I tried to like, Hey man, I'm an engineer. I want to help you do this. Cause I like engineering. I like helping people do stuff like that. But like, I don't give a fuck. Yeah. They just, just, you know, that was just, Oh, that's great that you can help us, but that's not why we're calling you. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's definitely, definitely a different dynamic, dynamic on the sales world. That's, that's interesting. interesting. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I definitely feel like at least at some point in my life, I probably should work just a straight sales job to understand that better. Yeah, yeah like I would, I would encourage everyone to give it a shot. You know, it's definitely not for everyone. It's definitely uh, you have to be a self motivated person for sure. Yep, and I've earned plenty of money working with engineers that wanted nothing to do with the sales side of things. Yeah, yeah hey, plenty of people are happy you know, behind their cat computer, yep. you know, but uh, 
Yeah, you, you, you got to have personality for it, absolutely. You know, if uh, if you don't like traveling, you don't like running out there, you don't like seeing people, and that's the thing, you know, that's why... I, I love all that stuff. See, that's, that's what I liked about it. Was I, I love the travel. That was my favorite part about it. It was like, I get a call, hey, I need you here tomorrow. I'd put me awesome. on a plane, I'll be there, you know? Yeah. And that's what I loved about Let's it. fire this missile off. Yeah, that's what I loved about it was just uh, being able to be there for people and help people. Because at the end of the day, like, this is why I told everyone, I was like, hey, man, I don't care if you buy my stuff or not. I just like doing cool shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, the, and they, you know, they appreciate that because that's really why I do. I just wanted to help people build stuff. You know, that was my whole motivation behind sales is can I help you build the coolest thing possible? <laughs> you know, whatever you're building, I want to hear about. I want to, I want to help you. You know, it doesn't matter what you're building. I just want to build. build. But I feel like that is weaving your technical background into it. I mean, the fact that you care about building awesome shit. I mean, that's an engineer's trait. Like that's well, and I, I think that's what helped me be an effective salesperson. Yeah, was behind the sale was my motivation was I wanted to help people build things. Yeah, didn't matter what it was. I just you know. I wanted to help people build whatever it was they're building because I just like building stuff. That's awesome. And I think that's, you know, I, you know, people could see that, you know, and I think it's definitely... Yeah, no, I, I, mean, I noticed it when you and I were stuck to work together. And right. This guy's fucking cool. And it's just, you know, I just... It, that's what gets me going, man. I, I love building stuff. Yeah, me too. <laughs> the bigger, the better, the faster, you know, sign me up. <laughs> so you started telling me about uh, just to get into fast... Things uh, you started talking about these Norwalt systems uh, the other day. Uh, they're servo actuated. And the rotary systems. Yeah, the twelve hundred per minute. Uh, something like that. Second like that. minute. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So those systems were pretty crazy. Um, we were dealing with some pretty insane forces. You know, the high RPM. You got a lot of load on them. Um, what they essentially were their turret capping system. So putting caps on bottles. Yeah, so it's a simple process. All we want to do is cap a bottle. Um, but to do it at the volumes we were looking for, you know, required a pretty intense machine. Um, and we had, uh, the design was to have several of these actuators on a rotary system that we were spinning at several hundred RPM. Um, so you're dealing with thousands of pounds spinning at, 600 rpm so you got some pretty intense forces there wow um so making a machine that wouldn't kill people yeah blow up you know <laughs> come apart you know as uh, elon likes to say uh unplanned disassembly you know i've <laughs> not heard that before that's funny yeah uh you know don't want unplanned disassembly of the system you know so it is uh that was a very intense uh project where you know, and that's also the challenge in, you know, machine building, especially that size and caliber of machines is safety. Yeah, the speed, I mean, alone is, is insane. Is dangerous, inertia, right. Yeah. And that's what, like, I, I had plenty of conversations with the folks I was working with where trying to just convey to them how dangerous the system can be if you do things wrong. You know, where you're like, there's a reason why we can't cut a corner here. There's a reason why we need these expensive bolts or whatever, because you have to, you know, my, my biggest fear while I was building these machines was hurting or killing someone. You yeah, know, these, ma these machines were no joke, you know, um, and they could easily, you know, kill someone or maim them for life, you know, and that was my biggest fear. So, like, you know, <laughs> luckily or not, I was put in charge of safety and that was my responsibility to make sure that I was building a safe machine. Wow. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, that was uh, one of my biggest fears while building this type of stuff was, you know, would I hurt someone? So I took, you know, the, you got to gotta build in layers of safety. You got to do your homework. You got to make sure, like, there's a reason why you do those uh, bolt, you know, calculations to make sure everything will hold together because, yeah. you know, th there's consequences for mistakes. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, it's, uh, you know. As the uh, carriage shooting into the woods. <laughs> yeah, perfect example, right? Yeah. You know, these machines, they have high forces, and if things go sideways, they could go sideways in a big way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's lucky no one got murdered from that. Oh, it is a miracle no one got hurt from that. Yeah, it was the fact that, like, yeah, they sent through three walls. They sent through their office. They didn't hurt anyone. It was a miracle. <laughs> they went through the office? <laughs> they did. Holy fucking moly. <laughs> 
There was the the craziest thing I saw like on that thing is not even nearly as crazy as that. It was just somebody over torquing a bolt at a facility I was at, and it got embedded in a concrete wall. But what you're talking about is an entire carriage going through three concrete walls. Thirty pound carriage going five Gs, <laughs> five meters a second. Thirty pound carriage. <laughs> like you do the math. That's <laughs> basically they turned into a rail gun. Essentially, is what they did. <laughs> It's crazy. Yeah. So yeah, and that's uh, that's why that's why you gotta put in safety and teach people how to run these things because you know and uh, not defeat the safety is yeah. The, don't the defeat the, the safeties. Machine. Don't override them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we that they're in there for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but absolutely, you know, it's uh, you know, and but that's why I like you know I'm a, I'm definitely a thrill streaker myself, and you know. You know, the, those turret systems in particular, when you see something spool up like that, 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 that thing gets moving, you know, and... You said 600 RPM. Right. Yeah. And, like, you, you and even systems like the, the high-speed rotary cell will deal at 3,600 RPM, right? You know, any engineer will look at it and understand the forces behind it. Yeah, well, I think I told you about being next to a mill turn that had a 200-pound workpiece that was spinning at 1,400 RPM. And I almost pooped in my pants. I mean, it was terrifying. Well, that's what I mean. Like, people, like, so <laughs> there's a good story. So we had an actuator that we were building, and we, we cranked up a full C. We, we did uh, destructive testing with it. And uh, so this actuator, it had a, the largest one had a 200-pound moving mass that we could get at 5G. <laughs> so un, un, ungodly forces. And we had to do a, a, a full crash test to basically destructive test to prove at 5g at 5g to prove that it wouldn't come apart and turn into a missile because basically essentially this thing it had end stops but if it blew past the end stops it's gone right yep um and one of the projects is we had to prove that our end stops were strong enough and be could handle a full speed crash if so someone 200 did. pounds at 5g 200 pounds at 5g yeah. yeah and we had to basically prove that Worst case scenario, if someone did eliminate all the safeties and did do all the wrong things. Over what distance? So it's a, it a one meter action. Okay, there. okay. Yeah. Um, we basically had to prove that they couldn't turn it into a missile. Yeah. And so we did a full destructive test where the only thing we could find in the building that was strong enough to handle those other forces was one of the I beams in the building. And it shook the whole damn building when we did it, but you know, it held together. <laughs> but you know probably within the month you know the ceo of the company came down and he wanted to he he wanted to see the thing run at full torque and we, we you know we were telling him like hey man like this is you know pretty serious and when he's doing his thing back and forth you know pretty run the mill he's like, oh crank it up crank it up crank it up we cranked it up for him and he fell on his ass <laughs> <laughs> he was so shocked by how fast that thing could move that he literally fell back and fell on his ass because it scared the <laughs> shit out of him. And it's just one of those things, like, people don't understand how much force, how fast these things can get unless they see it with their own two eyes. And it will make you shit your pants, you know? <laughs> these things are no joke. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a buddy who would teach uh, one of the shops at Carnegie Mellon, and I loved his shop training because it was like, this machine will kill you this way. This machine will kill you this way. Right. This machine will kill you that way. Yep. Well, I've been and in plenty of those factories. <laughs> I've been in all the safety videos where they show you all the ways that you could die in that facility. <laughs> I've seen them. I'm a big fan of that kind of training, though, because I feel like it's important to show that because otherwise some people Absolutely. are going to die. Well, it's a nice, quick way to get your point across, right? Yep. It's like, show, show them some real consequences. No, I, I always will advocate for that kind of training. Yeah, no, and that's why they show those videos. Like, people people get scared of them because, you know, they have their opinions. Oh, you can't show someone getting killed in this. But that's why they show them because that, that happened with someone. Yep. You know, so you've got to understand the consequences for mistakes, you know. 100% agree. You know, that's why people got follow procedures and not take shortcuts and do your lockout tag out. Oh my God. I, I saw one time an arc flash occur and two guys got knocked on their asses and they went right back to what they were doing. Yeah. It was, it was appalling. 
Well, I, yeah, that's what I mean, you know, like, uh, you know, the, honestly, the hardest job. You could see fear in their eyes, and then for some reason, they just went right back into it. The, the hardest thing about uh, machine building that, like, in my perspective, was how to keep the operator safe because they're their own worst enemies. <laughs> No, we had sense. we had people who would crawl underneath guarding, oh, kick in doors. Seriously? Oh yeah, like anything people gr- grinding the the lock. Any out. any yeah. anything you could think of, they'll find a way to break into that machine and put themselves in a dangerous position. And that I would say that was probably the most challenging part of machine building was how do I keep these fucking people safe? Like, cause <laughs> it's like, it's almost like they want to hurt themselves, you know? <laughs> like they'll do anything, you know, they like whatever for the sake of production or whatever. That's it. Is. it. It's, it's you know, the mentality of like, you got to build yeah, you know, and the, as they many just, units as, and people just get that stuck in there. Yeah. They don't want to shut down the skull. machine. You know, yeah. they don't want to shut down production. So they start doing sketchy stuff and they put themselves in these dangerous positions but that was probably the most challenging part of that job was keeping the people safe to not hurt themselves. You know, because people find a way. And I actually had a stick that I'd carry around with me when I was doing the FAT on the machines and doing... FAT? Uh, so basically the acceptance testing for the machines. Yeah. So after we would build a machine, bring it on site, we'd install and do the acceptance testings, uh, basically to prove it out before we ran it for production. Um, one of the first things that I did is I had a stick that I would poke around and I'd, you know, try to go through the guarding anywhere I could, anywhere I think someone would try to reach. Right. Yeah. And I'd, anything I could try to reach that could be any potentially dangerous. Oh, we need another piece of guarding here, a piece of Lexa in there, you know? Nice. And it was all just me poking and prodding because I know someone's going to do it. Right. Yep, so we'll find a broomstick, you know, what, and, you know these <laughs> yeah. people aren't even allowed tools. Like, you know, they're not allowed to have Allen key on them, you know, in the factory, but they would find a broomstick from the closet and they would stick it in there. So it was just like we had to, anything you could think of, you know, you just had to, you know, it, it, it wasn't hands and arms. Like it was people taking <laughs> a broomstick out of the, out, of the, out of the janitor's closet and sticking it in there, you know. Jeez, why the hell would you want to, well, I guess. For the sake of production, I guess. Anything it takes to, <laughs> yeah. to exceed the current thing. Because well, they, the it's all, honestly, the mentality was they didn't want to be the guy that stopped the machine. Yeah. And, like, you know, that's probably more of a cultural thing than anything else. I feel like that's especially strong in the U.S. and, mm-hmm. and maybe other parts of the world that I haven't been to yet. But Yeah, I know. Uh, you know, unfortunately, people will do a lot of dumb stuff for the sake of production. <laughs> yeah, no, I've seen some of it where you just... Chicken with your head cut off, you know, like running through walls, even if it actually hampers production Mm -hmm. because you think moving fast is going to make things better. Right. Crashing planes. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. Damn near crashing a plane. Yeah. 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 So it's, um, it's a pretty interesting dynamic. And that's what I liked about machine building because, you know, it's very much engineering and building a good effect on machine. And then also you got to, think about the operators and who's operating the machine. What are they going to think when something does this or that? You know, that is how, that? how are they going to react to it? You know, and you'd have to, you'd, you'd put in programming things to resolve issues and stuff. But, you know, there's always these unforeseen things that happens, especially for a first time, one of the kind build, you know, that's like, you know, one of the kind of machine that's never been built before. There's always things you don't expect to happen. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, a part may roll and might get stuck rolling. And, oh. And we had we had a we had an operator who that happened where a part was just sitting there rolling and it wasn't creating any issues, but it just annoyed them. They could see it there. Yeah. And so they they would you know get the broomstick, broomstick. right? Yep. Why? You know, it wasn't creating any issues. It wasn't hampering production, but it annoyed them. Makes sense. You know, and it's that type of stuff that when you're building these machines that you have to consider because at the end of the day, there's a human running that system. Yep. And you have to think, what are they going to do? How are they going to react to things like this? So if that was the, the really challenging part behind it. Yeah. You know, making operator friendly. How do you make the operators safe? You know, how do yeah. you keep them efficient? You How'd know? you do with the rolling part? Was it just... Making it so it would shut off if a person tried broomstick into it. Um, no, essentially what we did was 
we put some guides in that would prevent that. Nice. Knock it, knock it down, essentially. Makes sense. It was a super simple solution, but it was one of those things where if they told us about it, we, we could resolve it in five minutes, right? But they didn't want to talk to us about it. Yeah. You know, so it's a lot of that. Squeaky like, wheel or whatever. Right. And it was a lot of that, too, where, you know, like, you know, it goes back to com- good communication within, within the company. It's critical like everywhere. That, you know, um, you know, if you guys see an issue with the machine, let the automation group out. You know? <laughs> Probably a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. But so t- even something as minor as that, where it wasn't really impacting production or anything, but it just annoyed them, but it was a five minute fix and you're, you're no longer annoyed anymore, you know? Yeah. You're welcome. Right. Yeah. Just let us know. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But it was, it was very fun. And honestly, like, I love a good challenge and that was just a Same. whole different type of challenge, you know, was, you know, the human that human element of machine building yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah it was fun though very rewarding yeah sounds like it cool so i feel like that's probably a good note to call on is there anything else you want to bring up or plug uh no you know i'm pretty happy sweet all right well jeff thanks for coming on uh if you're listening this far and you want to keep doing it please subscribe i never say this but i should start doing it uh, get on the podcast channel on YouTube, subscribe today, and uh, Jeff, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Spencer. Hey, my pleasure, buddy.